So this, uh, this talk should come with a little warning that there may be some slightly fruity language. Please forgive me, but uh, I am from a tabloid background, so uh, that will be my excuse. My father would never approve. Okay, it is lovely to see you all here being traditionally British today, and I'm thrilled to be here with you all. Um, thank you. Oh, thank you. Polite, I'm just going to move this back a touch one second. Oh, may I do that without causing havoc? Polite, smartly dressed, wanting the best for your families and your country, working hard to pay your way, proud of your armed forces, proud of our beautiful Union flag and this land of hope and glory. You bunch of racist <laughs> bastards. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny how it works here in the UK these days, isn't it? Stand up for this country that you used to recognise and you're a racist bastard. Threaten to harm the British people or be linked to every terror attack in the UK since 7-7 and you're treated like royalty. I'm sure you all watched with interest and Jem Chowdhury coming out of prison on Friday. I was there last night at his new digs, a, a bail hostel in Camden, to see what he was up to. And at five o'clock on the dot, he left in a car with a chauffeur uh, driver and a woman in the car already dressed in a full burqa. Now, I mean, I say it was a woman. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Who knows what it was? Could have been damn well anyone or anything for that matter. And the ladies here, where are the ladies? We are few in number, are we not? Well, we're making our way. The ladies here will understand what I'm saying. If there's one thing that really pisses me off, it's a woman in a burqa at a sail rail. God damn it. You're dressed in a goddamn curtain. You do not need to be here at the sail rail. My needs are greater. Go away. I was privately hoping I'd see Anjem return from his evening jaunt, wherever it was he went to, and I was, had it all planned. I had my Dyson turbo hairdryer in my handbag, and I was going to blow it up that ridiculous nighty he wears and turn him into a giant Chinese lantern, his tiny extremist extremities exposed across the London skyline. But he didn't show up. And I got told off for standing on the steps of his hostel. Isn't it just lovely that we live in a country so tolerant and forgiving that we let Anjem out of jail, having only served half yes. of the sentence that he was supposed to serve, with him having refused to participate in a single de-radicalisation programme during his time inside jail. Now, instead of paying £50,000 a year to keep him inside the slammer, we will spend £2 million a year, plus his safe house and his cost of living and his wives, to watch the bearded weirdo lauded like a hero and enjoy his freedom. Extremist hate preacher types are, in fact, complete con, art uh, con artists, I think you'll agree. They stand on their pavements with their signs or in the mosque, preaching away, persuading fellow Muslims to go and blow themselves up. Go commit jihad. Allah will love you for it. You will go off to paradise and you will get 72 virgins. 72 virgins. That's more than you'll find in the whole of Birmingham. <laughs> you know, and I've been there. Uh, and I'm not one. Yes, anyway. Do uh, future jihadis never look at the bearded weirdo in the white nighty, telling them to do all this stuff and think, hold on a minute, Anchem, when did your jihad happen? Have you got like a, a sick note from games? Are you biffed it, Anchem? Why don't you ever have to go and blow yourself up? It's the sort of thing I would be asking. And I love the fact that these bunch of nutters now get their own terminology too. We're not allowed to call them Islamic extremists. We have to call them Islamist extremists. We have to tiptoe around. You can't call the rape squads majority Pakistani Muslim rape squads. You have to call them Asian men from Rotherham. Or more recently after the rape squads of Oxford, Oxford men. Ah, those learned men of Oxford. <laughs> Don't you just love them? All that prestige and heritage. 
Returning jihadis is also twisted speak, if you think about it. You aren't a returning jihadi. You were supposed to go and blow yourself up. You're just a bit shit at your job. <laughs> You're a failure, is what you are. I, um, I think Anjum is just a bit rubbish at being an extremist, and the fact that he's now a bearded weirdo living in a hostel in Camden is testament to that. He is essentially just like a paedophile, but with fewer actual friends. The London lovies who love him and live near the Bale Hostel aren't actually best pleased that he's there because it's near a school where their children go to. But they all voted Remain, so frankly, I don't give a damn what they think. <laughs> I'm talking of Romaniacs today. We're very well surrounded by them, thousands of the buggers, crawling out of the woodwork on scaled skin to spend some time basking in the strong sun shining out of Alistair Campbell's arse. <laughs> I saw him the other day, I think it was on Newsnight or some such, BBC giving him more airtime than ever, accusing Brexiteers of lying. Alistair Campbell. <laughs> accusing Brexiteers of lying and causing more conflict through our lives than any politician <laughs> in history. Yeah, all right, Alistair, dodgy dossier Campbell. It's a bit like being lectured on morality by Piers Morgan, who, as you will recall, pasted fraudulent pictures of our troops doing unspeakable things to Iraqis that they never did. But how easily these boys are, for are forgiven and their crimes forgotten. But we do not forget. We know the price of freedom. Many of you are former servicemen and women, or your fathers or grandmothers or grandfathers were, and it's all I ever wanted to be, was a soldier in the British Army. I went through Sandhurst as one of 30 girls, the Lumpy Jumpers, as we were called back in the day when you were allowed to say such things, and came out as one of eight girls, uh, passed out of the um, academy, with a 35-year regular commission in the Intelligence Corps, which my father always says is something of a joke. But uh, I didn't get to serve my time, thanks to chronic epilepsy that I was born with. And as much as I'm a rule breaker, some say a ball breaker too, um, I can see that an epileptic with a semi-automatic rifle is probably not my most magnificent <laughs> idea. But thanks to 12 good souls at the National Hospital for Neurology, um, 18 hours in surgery and a circular saw across my skull, I'm now cured. And so I live on to fight another day and fight in other ways. Thank you very much. <laughs> just trying not to, I didn't do anything. I just had a really nice sleep, like the best sleep I've had in ages. But I live to fight on. I'm here with you at conference and on the periphery of the media too, where I've been ousted, telling the truths as I see them straight from the road. And I will be out there later today with the Romaniacs and that lot screaming for a second vote on Brexit, reminding them in my character, Joan O'Brien, with her wig, uh, that we already voted and we voted to leave. Yes. You know, they'll be chanting. They had it planned. I saw it on Twitter. Hey, hey, Theresa May, let the people have their say. I mean, honestly, this is the intelligence, to speak to your point, intelligence levels have declined significantly and obviously. All the lovies will be out there. Bob Geldof, ooh. Brian Cox, ooh. Matt Lucas, the great bold weirdo. Hey, hey, Bob, Brian and Matt, we already voted, you stupid <laughs> <laughs> Gary Lineker, the crappy crisp salesman, paid for by the taxpayer, don't you just love that? He's obviously in on the action, as is every other rich tax-avoiding urbanite with no risk of ever having to use state schooling or the NHS. Because you will know, as well as I know, as a mum of three children under 14, those are the places that the rubber hits the road. If you load a country with 50,000 people uh, a year, and that's an underestimate massively in my personal experience with trucks through Calais, they sure as hell aren't going to be causing a queue at the exclusive Greycoat School just up the road, or at London Bridge Private Hospital. And rather than acknowledge our schools and our health service are collapsing under the deluge, what do we prefer to do? 
we blame our elderly, contributing all their lives, seldom causing bother, the real troopers of this nation, and yet held up every time as the reason the NHS is in crisis. Because old people are living longer, they say, over and over. Yes, they are. But they're not living as bloody long as the 50,000 Moroccans who arrived last week, are they? <laughs> typically, us very reasonable British types only have as many kids as we can fit into a reasonably priced car, not a bloody bus. A GP got in touch with me. He was sick of the silencing. He told me that he feels under pressure by his surgery. He can't speak out because of his work colleagues. That he's under pressure to write sick notes for migrants. That they bombard the surgery trying to work the system. And if they can't get a sick note from him, they'll shop around at the surgery for another appointment until they can get the sick note they need. And they know which doctors will even write them a sick note to get them out of sitting the British citizenship test. And that comes from a doctor inside who can't speak out because he'll be removed from his profession. On that note, actually, to those people who have failed to show up to speak today, I understand that we get death threats, but if you're not actually dead, then there is still a requirement for you to show up. <laughs> People call me a massive Islamophobe. I embrace that, although I am only nine stone eight. But my own Islamophobia came about when two jihadis <laughs> plotted to behead me as a wedding gift to each other. One lady, I, I think she's a Brit. Um, she asked for my head on a plate as proof of her new husband's love. She bought him a hunting knife and a dummy to practice on, which he duly did. And they were due to come and, uh, and get my head. Uh, some police officers dressed in black clothing turned up at my house one night, put an alarm in the top of my house, which I was to run up to shake if I needed assistance from the local constabulary. And as they left my house, they told me not to worry. <laughs> so I don't, and I live again to fight another day. But the reality for those individuals who head to the UK is not some kind of chaos or confusion. That's a myth perpetuated by the mainstream. They head for landing centres that they know of through their network of contacts that are shared on their mobile phones. Friendly places that will accommodate them, help them get their little feet under the table, help them access the benefit where you can get paid cash in hand, which doctor will write you the sick notes. They are signposting illegal immigrants how to work this country. And that's all happening right under our noses. And my nose is big enough to know it. Sometimes the cover-up falls apart to the point that even the mainstream media struggle with the lies that it's telling. And Grenfell Tower was a perfect example of this. It is a terrible tragedy. Nobody is dismissing that. But good Lord, have we not heard enough about Grenfell Tower. Could we hear any more about Grenfell Tower? Channel 4 News just can't get enough of it. I was there through the night as that tower burned. I was there next morning as it smouldered. And I was in conversation with a lady who lived in the block of flats directly opposite, who I felt incredibly sorry for. She was unsure of what to do for the best for herself and her child. And she was watching people burn. It is a tragedy, but it is also a huge lie. The authorities say that 72 people died, 72. You cannot look at that place such as it is without knowing that is not true. 129 apartments, massive subletting, adverts for subletting that I have 10 people, 12 people, huge overcrowding, designed for 600. Locals say twice that number lived on that block and more were there at that time because it was Ramadan. I mean, who knows what started a fire with open oil fires at Ramadan? Who could say? <laughs> but the locals say that more than 200 people never made it out. Invisible people, never officially here, so never officially alive or dead. And standing with them, good people, 
really traumatised by what they'd seen. That was just their honest recollection. At least 200 were missing. Grenfell was stuffed to the rafters with illegals and invisibles, a microcosm of its own, one of the landing bases for new arrivals in the UK, working the system, finding ways to make money from a government easy with taxpayers' cash. As evidenced, in fact, by the massive fraud in the aftermath, which hasn't been spoken about much either, really, half a million pounds of public money was fraudulently claimed by people pretending to be victims of the Grenfell Tower fire, and just £1,000 has been recovered. The Crown Prosecution Service has confirmed that much of the money lost may never be returned to Kensington and Chelsea Council, and charities that were duped into handing out the financial support to fake survivors. We heard endless accounts of suffering on Channel 4, and of course, Meghan Markle's sparkle pants turned up with a cookbook. How handy. Yeah. Love that. Um, but I met a little family at a hotel I was staying in on the South Bank, uh, Park Plaza. It's quite a nice hotel. They were having a lovely time living there, actually, and were really, really grateful. They had free accommodation, free food, use of the sauna facilities and vouchers for presents and clothes. And I asked them if they'd ever been interviewed by the media. They said they had talked to the media, but they weren't interested in talking to them because they had no complaints and were having a nice time. And there was a sort of sweetness about it because they were so grateful and I was happy that they were safe, but equally it shows the duplicity of our media that they will not tell maybe other sides of a story than the agenda that they're looking to follow. And it's a hotel that many of us, certainly myself, couldn't afford to put my family in for a week. And that imbalance is what we see constantly in this country, I think. Those recently arrived are somehow always at the front of the queue. And our elderly and our taxpayers are elbowed to the back, last in line for school places or on endless wait lists for surgery. I've met so many mums and they email me, you know, to say that they didn't get their first or second or third place for their children. And they're in tears. What shall I do? How do I change this? I get emails from 80-year-old people, and it might be the first email they've typed because of the damn thing called the internet that makes no sense. And they say that they will be glad when their time is up here in the UK because they do not want to live to see their country fall. Yeah. And those are really, really hard emails to get. But you don't have to look too far to see what this country could be like. I recently returned from Poland, where I was annoying lefties, and um, it's a hobby. Uh, Poland has a policy of zero illegal immigration. It's now officially the safest place in the whole of Europe to be a woman, and it has had zero terrorist attacks. The Christian faith is front and centre. There are no mosques to be seen or to speak of, and the Polish faith, I know, right? Polish culture is strong and celebrated and the Law and Order Party are in power, delivering on their manifesto promise of zero illegal immigration. And one strange thing happened to me while I was there. I saw some girls just in their shorts and t-shirts cycling on bikes and it was like 8, 8.30 at night, it was still light. And I was struck, girls on bikes, 8.30. And I was looking around and there was something odd about it and I realised what was upsetting or, or troubling me was I felt the need to go and look after them, or something motherly. And it was the fact they had not a care in the world. And what upset me about that was not that they had not a care of the world, because that's a perfect thing, is that I noticed I was alarmed for them. I was anxious because I come from the UK where that couldn't happen. And, and that's a really striking sign, I think, of how far this country has fallen. They've not bought into mandatory multiculturalism. They've defied... Merkel on migrant quotas, and they've defended their borders beautifully. When the Saudis rang the Law and Order Party, as folklore has it, to ask if they could build a mosque in the city of Warsaw, the Law and Order Party told the Saudis to get back in touch when they could build a cathedral in Dubai. <laughs> I've got to a point now where I don't care if that story is true or not. I just love it all the same. 
And it's this attitude of smart defiance that seems necessary to protect one's citizens. Smart defiance. You see it with Matteo Salvini refusing to accept the NGO ferry boats across the Med, bringing half of Libya to Europe. No to the boats. You see it in Hungary, where Orban said no to migrants Merkel, Merkel's migrant quota, and where he's just recently banned gender studies, which I love. Yeah. I love. And you see it in Austria, too, where they've said no to the burqa and they will fine you if you're caught wearing one. And in Sweden, too, and I've spent some time there in those suburbs where I was told to go suck my mum. I politely declined. And the Swedish Democrats have said no to migrant violence and no to the rape of white girls. And in the UK, actually, where 17.4 million people said no to the EU, and I will be out there defending that later today, in my words, I say no right. I will not be si silenced either. Smart defiance. You know, we're not alone, even though we feel it sometimes, surrounded by the madness of our time. We are part of a much larger family that is growing across Europe, prepared to show smart defiance and say no. And of course we see it in America, where the lines for Trump's rallies reach for miles and the American economy is booming. And I will be over there in a couple of weeks' time campaigning against mad Maxine Waters. And we will try and win that this year. Trump will take 2020. There is hope. And that's where you come in, all of you. You don't have to. We don't have to watch this country fall. We can make a difference. Firstly, and most importantly, and it's something you guys clearly are all doing a good job of, we must resist the narrative. Just because someone said it and they're wearing a uniform and a badge doesn't make it true. We have to question everything that we're told to believe because the real truth is seldom the fabrication fed to you by the mainstream media. After terror attacks in our country on UK soil, we do not stand united. We do not carry on as normal. Mothers and fathers bury their children. We reject the narrative. Secondly, we commit to arm ourselves with the truths. Sadly, in the UK, we don't have a Second Amendment. I am a member of the NRA, the National Rifle Association, and I wear that badge very proudly on my car when I do the school run, just to <laughs> off the other mothers. <laughs> our police on our streets are armed with the equivalent of a bottle of Sillip Bang and an antibacterial <laughs> hand wipe, and frankly, that's not good enough. But we can arm ourselves with information, information that we find closest to the source from alternative news sources, not information fed to us through the liberal filters of Google. We find our truths on Anjem Chowdhury's doorstep at 9 p.m. We must look for our own truths and help others to find them too. And thirdly, we have to find the strength to withstand the constant attacks that we face. And I know it's hard. Some of us, many of us, will have been rejected by friends for your opinions or your views. Some of you may no longer speak to family members. People can be incredibly unkind. The media can be merciless. But we all need to find the moral courage to stand strong. And of course, I have battles of my own on that front. I've been investigated by 12 uh, police constabularies up and down the country. I've been interviewed under caution by the Metropolitan Police Crime and Major Homicide Command for a <laughs> column in a newspaper. Two men interviewed me in a police cell with one of those old tape recorders. Do you remember record and play at the same time? They literally did that when I walked in. I was like, oh, that's the oldest tape recorder I've ever seen. And I had a good speech for them that day. 
My barrister said it was the first time he'd seen two police officers look more frightened than the person that was going in for the questioning. <laughs> and, um, I, um, obviously, I've had jihadis uh, plotting to cut my head off. Um, members of the public uh, ring social services to report me as a mother in the hope that taking my children away uh, will silence me. These are the sorts of things we face, and that's okay. I have no complaints. I, I'm not a victim. There's no self-pity. If I don't like it, you know, I can go home, sit on my sofa and shut up and become a victim or, or maybe trans. And that's not... <laughs> <laughs> People sometimes say, gosh, Hopkins, you're a jolly good-looking bloke. I'm like, oh, this. thanks very much, I am. <laughs> but together we can save Britain from itself. We reject the narrative. We arm ourselves with the truth. And we find the moral courage to stand strong. This is our time. <coughs> we will not let this country fall. We will get furious and we will fight back for Britain, traditional Britain. Thank you very much. Thank you.